Thank you for joining once again for the weekly teaching of the Dead Sea School of Faith that I abide by. And just like the other times, this is going to be a question and answer session where you guys ask questions and I'll give the answers based on my understanding from my own faith. Um, so we already have some questions that were asked. Oh, I'm good. Va Valerie was able to sign on. Good to have you here. Um, so I'm going to be starting to answer these questions that have been submitted to me. And the, the benefit of being here live, for those of you who are listening to this being recorded, what I'm doing is doing this once a week, and people here can ask me questions live and about any topic so it really is cool to you know to figure out if you have questions about certain topics uh, this is a great way uh, an interactive way it's like a sermon but it's an interactive sermon where you uh, are able to direct the flow of the study that we're doing if you attend so that's what this is and I'm going to start now. Okay, so the there was a question asked by Sharon, and she says, I had a question about the Urim and Thummim. I read the other day that it was witchcraft, and I was very confused. I don't really understand it at all. And uh, Laura also speaks of the same issue and says, I was just studying that Urim and Thummim and would like to know myself and also Aaron's staff as a tool for divination. So basically, we have in the scriptures different commands of uh, what we are to do and what we are not to do. And among the things that are forbidden for us are witchcraft, you know, the magic, uh, and it's but it's the type of magic that is dealing with uh, demons and worship of other beings rather than worship of of our creator and so let me give an example take the what the technology we're using right now the internet if you take that and go to people thousands of years ago they would consider that magic they would consider this magic they would consider airplanes magic cars magic pretty much everything we're doing and using throughout our daily lives that's magic to them uh, so we have to figure out what does magic really mean and it seems to me that the scriptures indicate that magic is uh, having powers over the world through the uh, through appealing to other beings as uh, in a worship sense because if you I've done a little bit of study of magic I mean I, I haven't studied it you know as trying to do it but I've looked into like about what other people do and they were actually magic magician practitioners throughout the Middle Ages they were Christians Jews Muslims all different kinds and a lot of this magic stuff that was being done when you look it'll say something like I adjure or I summon so and so demon or angel to come to my service and to do stuff for me. Well, you know, if we're calling demons to us or we're calling evil angels to us, that's obviously that's not going to be good. But that's a way, that's one of the primary ways of magic is appealing to other beings to do stuff for you. Uh, a second way of that is also similar, but it's uh, for instance, let's say a demon was to have a symbol or a special item. Well, if a person starts using that item, even though they're not, they might not be praying to that demon. In a way, they are praying because they are appealing to the object that comes from the being. So it's all about like who is it being addressed to and how are you doing it. In other ways, peop there, there were magicians who, 
who used uh, other gods, like they appealed to different gods like of nature, where they actually worshipped nature, and so they would pray to nature, and they would use nature to do different magical stuff. So it, let me try to think of an example here. It'd almost be like, uh, it'd almost be like saying, uh, I, I can't think of a good example, but it's just, uh, uh, tr you trying to use certain objects for magical purposes that those objects do not have. So you're assigning power to it that's that we don't have the right to assign to it. Um, so it's just crossing the lines into worship of other beings. That's what it's really about. So when you look in the scriptures, we're going to see miracles. We're going to see Moses doing miracles. We're going to see Aaron doing miracles. We're going to see Elijah, Elisha. They did so many miracles. The Messiah did miracles. You know what he did? He uh, he would, um, for one person, a blind person, he spit in the ground, made some mud, and applied it to the person's eyes. That was actually something that was very common in magical rites uh, uh, in other cultures. Uh, in the in the in the pagan, the pagans would do something similar. Uh, how were they doing this? Because they knew about the magical features of this. But it's not so much magic, it's more of, of health. Uh, but it became magical when they started using it in conjunction with other spirits. So when you're combining spiritual power with, with uh, natural things, then it becomes forbidden. And um, so in regards to the Urim and Thummim, these were specific ways that were given to his people, Israel. They were given to his people to consult and know his will when Yahuwah does not want to speak to them in, in another way. So in other words, the normal way people receive messages from Yahuwah is uh, from, from God, the Creator, you know, the normal way they receive messages from him is they have to wait for him to answer they basically are you know they have to wait for who to decide you know what okay i'm going to answer him the prophets isaiah the prophet uh, for instance he didn't just to say okay i'm going to have a prophetic vision now no rather it was yahuwah who's decided okay i'm going to give you isaiah a a vision right now when I want not when you want it might not be convenient for you but uh, here's a vision for you right now it, so that's how it kind of went it was the person was righteous enough to receive prophecy but they couldn't control when the prophecy was coming uh, so they were filled with the spirit and then the spirit was basically telling them what it wanted to tell them they couldn't control the content of their prophecy the Urim and Thummim, on the other hand, was a way that Yahuwah gave us to control prophecy or to control, to, to get what we want to know, but in a way that was approved by Yahuwah. So it's basically what, what it was for was you would ask questions and then Yahuwah would answer through the, through the Urim and Thummim. They were basically stones and one would light up a certain way to tell you an answer and the, it would be like a yes or no answer or a this side or that side answer. Uh, so it was a way of communicating through Yahuwah in a way that you could ask him any question and receive an answer. Only if you were righteous enough. And it had to be through the priesthood. According to the original law of Moses found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Scroll, the Urim and Thummim was required to be consulted by the king before he went to battle and war. He was not allowed to fight anyone in the army he wasn't allowed to send his army out unless he went to the high priest and the high priest consulted Yahuwah and asked him do we have permission to go out will we be successful and if Yahuwah said don't go out you're not gonna win then they wouldn't go out and if he said you may go out because you will have victory because I approve of what you're doing then they would go out and that's how it was supposed to be done that was what the law was teaching uh, in the temple scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls so the Urim and Thummim is a special way of helping us, just like the scriptures. The scriptures were given to us 
we consult the scriptures to find answers to our questions. It's a, it's ba it's a very similar thing, except the Urim and Thummim was more specific to the people at the time. You consulted it to ask for help about your life. Um, second here. Yeah, so, and, uh, yeah, you know, people might be comparing it to witchcraft or magic, things like that, but the problem with that is, as I said, there's counterfeits. Satan and the demons, they have counterfeits. So, something can be very close to the truth, but then be off track. So, uh, for instance, if I take, if I take, basically, basically the Urim and Thummim are rocks. They're basically rocks. So if I take a rock and I say, okay, rock, tell me who, you know, tell me who I'm going to marry or tell me something, you know, like basically, you, what is the sin being done here? Here's a serious sin being done here. What the sin is, is you are giving that rock power over your life, saying this rock has the power to tell the future and to direct my life, and that's essentially blasphemy. That is a uh, that's what's going wrong here. Uh, similarly, when you're using the Ouija boards, you are using that in a way of uh, asking the Ouija board for answers or asking the spirits for answers, and we're not supposed to be doing that. Now, here's what I believe is okay to do. You can ask, like, uh, you, can, you, can, you can roll dice. Let's say you roll dice. And you say, okay, if, it's a, if, if, it, if I get a five, then I'm going to do this. If I don't get a five, then I'm not going to do this. The basic thing is you're not, when you're doing that, you're not saying that the dice has power over your life or that, it, that it's mad, you know, like that it's, that it's a... Uh, that it has spirit in it, all you're doing is using it as a randomizer, a randomizer, and you're knowing that all things are not random. There's physics, but there's also Yahuwah and the spirits, uh, uh, when I say spirits, I mean angels. They, they, can, they can direct the dice that you throw to make it uh, be a certain result. But so when you do that, you're not you're not doing that the same way as you use stones by like taking the stones and say, all right, stones, you have power over my life. Tell me the future, you know, or tell me the truth. Like basically, basically, if you ask stones, if you say to stones, uh, okay, which god is the true god, and then you you throw the stones and see where it lands. That is not a righteous thing to do because you're trusting. You're trusting something in the stones that you should not be trusting. But if you take rocks and say, uh, like, you, you're not speaking to the rocks as if they are alive. You're just speaking to the rocks, uh, not speaking to the rocks, but you're just saying, okay, I'm just going to throw these rocks. They're lifeless, but I'm just going to throw them. And the rocks might point to something randomly. And you know, I can't make a decision. I'm not sure what to do. So I'm just going to leave it in God's hands. It's going to be random to me, but God knows what's going to happen. And... Ultimately, it's going to be the best whatever happens, so I can't make a decision, so I'm just going to throw these rocks, and it'll point to something. That's okay to me. I don't see a problem with that. What I see a problem with is when you use these things as an indicator of truth, when when God has not gave that power to it. So the Urim and Thummim were very special. Why? Because it got, had God's authority. He put his spirit in those rocks to give it power. But if I take random rocks, it doesn't have his spirit in it. But if I'm using it as if it does, that's that's uh, that's a sin. So that's the there's a fine line of what Yahuwah gives us to use, and then what we try to use. Um, it's like it's like trying to force God to speak to us. How dare we do that? You know, how do we try to force him to to talk to us? Uh, so if we're trying to make him talk to us, like, or, so for instance, uh, talking to the dead. In the, the scriptures, there are instances where the, re where, where the dead appear to people in dreams. But that's not a sin. Why is it not a sin? Because the person the dream was given to did not seek out. They didn't consult the dead. They were just given a, a dream by Yahuwah uh, from the person that, that died. 
So it's an issue of are you seeking it out yourself or are you being given that permission? Are you being given that by by Yahuwah? Uh, that's that's the line which determines what's magic and what's not magic. What's what is okay to do in terms of something very similar to magic and then what's not okay. So miracles they're so similar to to magic, but the key is who who and how are the miracles being done? It's being done through our creator and in a way that he has approved, given us permission. Uh, and there was a question, uh, can I give a scripture where a dead person came to someone in a dream and it was okay? Here's one example. Now, not everyone accepts this book as scripture, but I do. And I'm going to read this uh, one passage. This is from 2 Maccabees. And it says, uh, let me find it here. Um, so it says uh, in Second Maccabees, uh, chapter fifteen, and starting with verse eleven, it says, "He armed each of them." not so much with confidence in shields and spears as with the inspiration of brave words and he cheered them all by relating a dream a sort of vision which was worthy of belief what he saw was this Ornia, uh, Onias who had been high priest a noble and good man of modest bearing and gentle manner one who spoke fittingly and had been trained from childhood in all that belongs to excellence was praying with outstretched hands for the whole body of the Jews. Then likewise a man appeared, distinguished by his gray hair and dignity, and of marvelous majesty and authority. And Onias spoke, saying, This is a man who loves the brethren and prays much for the people and the holy city, Jeremiah, the prophet of God. Jeremiah stretched out his right hand and gave to Judas a golden sword. Uh, Judas is Judah Maccabee. Uh, gave to him a golden sword and as he gave it he addressed him thus take this holy sword a gift from god with which you will strike down your adversaries encouraged by the words of judas so noble and so effective in arousing valor and awaking manliness in the souls of the young they determined not to carry on a campaign but to attack bravely and to decide the matter by fighting hand to hand with all courage because the city and the sanctuary and the temple were in danger. Uh, it keeps going, but that's the end of the, the passage. So basically, that's one example. But here's another one that you guys for sure probably accept. That's from the New Testament, and that's the Transfiguration. On the uh, the account of the Transfiguration, they actually saw Moses uh, and Elijah. Now Elijah was not dead, but Moses already had died, and yet they they were actually speaking to Moses in a vision. Uh, so that is an example of them speaking with uh, the dead. But note, they didn't, they didn't call Moses to them. They were blessed when Moses came to them. They saw Moses. So that's just an example. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. It's, it's, uh, Yahuwah can do miracles. He's all-powerful. Miracles is just a, something that has a control over nature that we don't have ability to do naturally. But there are ways to do it uh, if you have enough access to, to the spirit. Um, so there's nothing wrong with miracles. And when it comes from Yahuwah, that's when it's righteous. That's when it's okay. So hopefully that answers the question about the, the Urim and Thummim. Now, another question was about Noah and his family. Uh, they called down Enoch from heaven uh, to ask him a question about Noah's wife. Now that's slightly inaccurate. Basically, they didn't call down Enoch so much, but they were calling up to him, asking him to help. Now, where was Enoch? According to the scriptures, Enoch was taken away to the place where the angels were, but it was still on earth. And so they went to the ends of the earth, according to the Dead Sea Scroll documents, and uh, 
they were asking him for help and uh, they knew that he would be able to hear them uh, so this is it's not wrong to summon anyone uh, because it, it's not necessarily wrong to like okay so give, let me give an example let's say I call you on the phone uh, that's not a sin right because we ha there is a connection even though we're far away we are super far away uh, even though uh, that calling you on the phone is not or you know what, what, what we're doing right now we are very far distance away yet we're communicating that is a similar thing that uh, that Methuselah did with Enoch and l let me uh, explain a little bit because this is an important concept in the scriptures you're gonna find something called prayer the word prayer in the older translations that word prayer or not prayer but the word pray it actually means petition request beg and it does not just mean speaking to Yahuwah it can be speaking between you and me uh, so for instance someone might say in the older English they'll say I pray thee speak to me or you know I, I, I the word I pray thee that phrase that was used not meaning prayer it wasn't talking about prayer but it was talking about a request petition that you had for someone you're asking them to do something for you so what I discovered through my own journey in life is that actually people people can hear each other's thoughts sometimes and so just as we're talking like on the phone calling each other I believe that you can also try to send thoughts to people and hope that it's gonna that they're gonna hear it you won't you don't assume they're gonna hear it but you hope they'll hear it somehow and it is through a uh, it is through the natural way that God has given us uh, he has created our minds with very powerfully there's so many examples of where our, our thoughts can affect other people's thoughts let me just give an example where uh, a mother a mother suddenly out of nowhere senses her children are in danger and they are in danger this has happened many times I'm sure you guys have heard of some stories like that and basically what is happening there is their children are so afraid and scared that it's actually sending warning thoughts to the mother they have a connection because they are deeply connected emotionally it's that that's not magic that is just the system that Yahuwah has designed naturally where we are we have connections with people we have connection with family so Methuselah when he went to, to find Enoch and he was asking him for help he wasn't assigning him magical powers but he was crying out to him in desperation hoping that he would hear him somehow and they had that connection and he was they were able to hear he was able to hear him uh, and come down so it's just kind of like uh, yelling from a distance and hoping that the person's gonna hear you far away it's not magic or anything like that so but that that comes from a book uh, there's two books of that and that is a book of Lamech in the book of Enoch in the book of Enoch chapters 106 to 107 I believe it is it tells that story uh, about Methuselah going to Enoch and consulting uh, him asking for help about Noah because Noah's Noah was born and he looked like an angel so they were asking for help uh, to figure out was Lamech truly the father was she faithful to him or did she commit adultery did she sleep with an angel and in the Dead Sea Scrolls was found the original version of that story it was written by Lamech Lamech was the father of Noah he actually wrote his own book and it's a much longer version of the story that Enoch tells us in his book so the book of Enoch has this story Lamech has this story in a much longer form and it's more impressive more powerful more inspiring in Lamech's own words what happened and uh, so yeah that 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 hopefully that answers that question uh, Lamech wrote his own book and Enoch then wrote his own book you know Noah we found Noah in the Dead Sea Scrolls book of Noah and the book of Abraham we found those books not fully preserved they were fragmentary but we found them written by them themselves and Ju the book of Jubilees tells us actually quotes and uses these books and says they are valid and they are scripture so if we accept Jubilees we got to accept these other writings too and scholars join them together as the Genesis Apocryphon.
But so the genesis of Pacophon is a, a key foundational document. It's the source of Genesis. It came before Genesis. Moses actually used these writings to help him write Genesis. And the Book of Jubilees used these writings as well. So uh, now there's another question. Talking about uh, Leviticus, the laws about clothing. Talking about uh, what is okay to use for the fabrics uh, and what's okay to wear. There's something called uh, lycra spandex. That's a special material that some clothing is made out of. And uh, the question is, is it okay to wear stuff like that? Well, you know, the scriptures are, they don't address the, is it okay to use uh, man-made materials? Because there wasn't really any man-made materials at the time. But what I can tell you is what I believe and, and why I believe it. And that is... The Dead Sea Scrolls and the scriptures teach a emphasis on purity and naturalness. And my position is we are to wear natural clothing. So uh, it seems to me that if our clothes are made out of unclean fibers or, you know, um, unnatural fibers, then that's wrong. I th feel like we should not be using that stuff because it has bad chemicals in it and, uh, and other things like... I polyester uh, po polyester garment if you're wearing a polyester garment uh, from my understanding the natural clothes have small holes in them because that's natural and it breathes natural clothing breathes it, it breathes in air to your body allows for circulation uh, it's good but when you have unnatural clothing it, it doesn't breathe and it's uh, and when you sweat, it you know uh, it reacts with the the unnatural fibers, things like that. So I'm very uh, I I just say you know this is unnatural stuff. I don't want it touching my body, so I get it away. Here's where I start to get it unsure, and I don't want to go too extreme. But there's something called organic clothing, and there's also even that is not always the best. Uh, there there's even more. Uh, better than organic clothing but basically the idea is there are some toxic dyes and toxic chemicals that can be in some of these clothing and it can get absorbed into your body so my recommendation for those who are unsure about what is okay to wear i i recommend don't wear anything that's unnatural in the ingredients in the in the garment and then secondly uh unfortunately they're gonna have these toxic dyes in most clothing unless you pay a lot of money or make your own clothing uh, so what you want to do is test test it out and see like like the clothes you're wearing right now you see how does it feel like when you put on clothing do you feel itchy do you feel uncomfortable are you getting rashes things like that you want to observe like that when you're seeing hmm when I put this type of garment on I don't feel good or I feel uncomfortable or I feel irritated that may be a sign an indication that that's not okay to wear and you need to stop wearing that I can't say for certain and I'm not going to the full extreme of the clothing yet I haven't gone so that I only wear organics you know super organic clothing uh, but I try to you know I try to see if it's harming me or not and a lot of my clothes are very old so the, the fact is when you get new clothes that's when the most toxins are in it. If you have used clothes, a lot of the toxins have already gone away from it. Uh, so you just have to kind of uh, try to be as pure as possible as you can and make sure that the, the, the impurities don't get absorbed into your body. Because here's the thing. Let's say you got pork, right? Pork. We're not supposed to eat pork. But if you have, if you take, if you're holding a piece of bacon, or if you're holding a pig, if you're holding a baby pig in your hand, it's still alive and you're just holding it, that's okay. Uh, it's not going to get absorbed into your skin because it's, um, it's so it's th something like that where uh, as long as the uncleanness is not getting into your body, it's okay to be around it. If it's getting absorbed into your body, that's 
that's where it becomes a sin. That's where you, the, the basic idea is, you know, when you're eating unclean animals, the uncleanness goes into your cells. It gets absorbed into your cells. Whereas if you uh, if you touch something dirty, it hasn't gotten into your cells yet. It's still on your skin. It hasn't gotten absorbed into your body yet. So you may want to wash your hands or something or, you know, wipe it off. But it hasn't gotten absorbed into your body to defile you yet. That's the distinction. Um, so it's a difficult question about the, the clothing, but that's what I would say about the clothing. Um, that's how I try to deal with it. Now, I was asked a question by Valerie, and she says, What is your view of eschatology? Are we in the end of days? Could you give a very brief view of what you see as our place on God's timeline of the ages? What is next? The return of the Messiah? Okay, basically, uh, my position on this is we have quite a long time to go. I, I think uh, he's only going to be coming back in about 160 years from now. I tried to figure out the proper time using uh, the 7,000 year theory. Basically, the theory states that 6,000 years from creation is when he's going to come back, and then the 1,000 years after it's going to be the Millennial Kingdom. That'll be the Sabbath of 1,000 years. And so I try to figure out, okay, when is the creation? And then add 6,000 years to that. And when I did that, using the best manuscripts, like Jubilees, uh, it brings me to uh, 6,000th year being about 160 years from now. So it's still a while from now. And what I think is going to be happening is I feel like most of the seals hasn't even happened yet. So what has to happen still? The war scroll. The war scroll describes a 40-year war, a 40-year long war fought by Israel against all the nations. Not all of them, but most of the nations. That 40-year war has not happened yet. Uh, so we've still got a 40-year war. we got the temple that needs to be built. According to the Book of Enoch, the temple there's going to be a third temple built, and that actually is going to be built before the judgment takes place. That's what Enoch himself says. He says, before the judgment takes place, the temple will be built, and he and Elijah will come down. Enoch says this in his book. He'll come down with Elijah and be there in the temple with the righteous sheep. And so uh, that still has to happen. The temple has to be built, um, and... Have you guys seen the sun or the moon start doing crazy stuff? Like, uh, it says that one-third of the sun is going to be, like, dark. That has not happened yet. And it's not talking about an eclipse, okay? It's not talking about an eclipse. It's clearly talking about the sun itself being darkened. Something's going to happen to the sun. Same thing with the moon. Something's really crazy going to happen. The stars, they're going to start going crazy, falling out of order. Uh, it's, you know, all the... There's so much stuff that has to happen yet. So many bad things going to happen. Uh, we're quite far from from all the. I, there's so many extra books that talk about many other things that have to happen, and there are some amazing prophecies of last times events which just have not happened yet. So I still see us quite a far way from the very end of when he comes back. Uh, the war scroll is what I was referring to. It's the uh, the the forty year war, uh, and I'm interpreting Revelation literally, correct? But I'm I'm not basing my views entirely on Revelation. I accept it as scripture, so I I don't think my views contradict it. But I'm basing it on so many other writings. There's like a ton of other writings which give much extra details about things that have to happen. So, uh, and the you mentioned about uh, could the 40-year war be when Satan is let out for a little while? Because the Revelation, the book of Revelation says Satan will be let out for a time. But according to Revelation, that actually happens at the end of the 1,000 years. Uh, and in my understanding, the war it's talking about is beginning uh, before the 1,000 years. So the 40-year war comes before the 1,000 years. Satan is bound during the 1,000 years, and then at the very end of the 1,000 years, he's released for a small amount of time. 
uh, and yeah, I can share some of these books. I can give a list of some of the books that have this extra eschatology of the last day's information. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, and Enoch was uh, taken to, he was taken to the, I think it was the Garden of Eden, and that's where the angels were. Uh, but it might have been one other place that he was also as well. But he was being taught uh, by the angels for a very long time in a separate place, away from most of mankind. But it was on earth. It wasn't in another, in another place. Um, so I think I was able to catch up with all the questions so far. Um, so do you guys have more questions on your mind of the things that I have shared? Um, and I'll see if what you guys want to do. What I can do is, if I, if I don't see any more questions, uh, then I can ask you guys, um, well, we lost Valerie. Hopefully she'll come back. Oh, there she is. Okay. Um, what I can do is, like, if you guys don't have any more questions, I can go through one one of these extra books, which I find very cool book. Uh, and if you want, we can go through some of that, and I can read some of what it's gonna, what it tells us of prophecy. So we can go through some of that and show you what I believe still has to happen. So if you want, we can do that. Or if you guys have more questions, we can deal with that first, and then see how much time we have left. But so. What, what do you guys think? You wanna, do you have more questions for me about any other topics? Uh, or would you like me to, to go through this one book? I'm gonna load my, I'm gonna load the file. Uh, one second here. All right, so I'm going to go through the book, uh, not the whole thing, because there are certain parts of the book that I haven't quite figured out yet in my understanding, so I don't want to confuse people uh, by reading certain parts I'm unsure about myself, but I read the parts that I am confident on myself. Um, so this book is called The Revelation or the Apocalypse of Daniel. It was found in the Syriac language. There is only one copy of the book known to man. Only one copy in the Syriac language. It was translated recently into English. And I have some really amazing stuff in there. Of course, the scholars say that this was not written by Daniel, but it's pseudepigrapha, they say. But I believe it's scripture. It speaks to me with divine inspiration, and it's very powerful. So I'm going to read from it while it's loading now. It's a PDF file. Again, these are the words of Daniel the prophet himself. I, I believe they are the, the very words of Daniel. And that's what they claim to be. They claim to be his words. But right now it's being kind of slow for me the file um, okay all right it's loading now okay good so I got it loaded so I'm gonna start reading let's see here well let me just read a couple parts before the prophecy begins I'm just gonna skip you know I'm gonna go through a couple parts not read the whole thing but just to kind of show you what the book is like uh, to to show you why it's connected to Daniel. Uh, so it starts off at the very beginning. It says, 
This is what the scribes say at the beginning. They say, By the power of God we record the revelation which was revealed to Daniel the prophet in the land of Persia and Elam. So it begins and says, In the kingdom of Darius the Mede, who ruled over Persia, and in the kingdom of Alpactan, king of Babylon, I have seen these visions, I, Daniel the prophet, and these prophecies were revealed to me following those visions which I had seen, as well as that prophecy which was revealed to me by the Holy Spirit during the years of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who came up against the land of Judah and the holy city, Jerusalem, as he had been commanded by God to besiege it and to bring distress upon it. Uh, so, it starts off like that. Um, you know, there's, there's one, uh, it goes a little later, it says, we were in captivity and exile, I, Daniel, and all the young men of my age, sons of Jewish men chosen to serve in the king's palace and to stand in the king's palace according to rank. The great God of my fathers bestowed upon me a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of knowledge, and a spirit of understanding. And I excelled in every kind of wisdom over those of my age who were with me in the land of Babylon and of the Chaldeans, because I kept the commandments of my God, and also because I did not do evil against his laws and judgments. I revealed and explained what would happen in Babylonia and concerning everything that had happened to the former kings who were in Babylonia in those days. So, you know, it talks about that. He goes over, uh, he reviews some of the information that was already in the book of Daniel that we knew. Uh, some really interesting stuff. To me, it speaks of truth and divine inspiration. Um, let's see here. Um, so I'm just going to skip the rest. There's some really amazing stuff in the book, but I'm just going to skip all that and start going into the prophecies. Uh, so I went with him to Persia and Elam. These great prophecies were revealed unto me, and I revealed surpassing visions without end and without number. Mysteries and seasons and signs and wondrous visions, and I expounded the times when the days of this age are ending, and the end of completion, that which the Holy Spirit had shown Daniel in Persia and Elam during the days of King Darius, that which is yet to come, and which is hidden to be revealed at the end of days, at the end of the seasons, and at the consumption in seven weeks, in the season of seasons, and at the completion of times, the days and the mysteries are to come. Uh, wondrous is the vision which will be revealed at the completion of times and at the end of days and at the end of seasons and also at the completion of the rulers of Zion and at the completion of Jerusalem. The wise and those who keep the covenant will understand this book and at the end of ends let them be moved by it. Now that, and uh, just so you know you can ask questions while I'm reading through this and I can try to address them. Uh, so, as I said, it's, they said, he said, Daniel had said, the wise and those who keep the covenant will understand this book, and at the end of ends, let them be moved by it. The peoples of the north will revolt, and there will be much motion and a great earthquake on the face of the earth. And there will be these signs, like the voice of angels, and like the tumult of the heavenly armies, it will be heard. There will be a great uproar from heaven until high mountains will be made equal to plains. Then will be gathered the four winds of heaven, one to the other, and there will be a great and vicious battle. Also the corpses of the slain will be gathered like mounds. The western horn will rise and break the winds of heaven, and it will hold fast until the end of days. Signs will appear on earth, a commotion on the islands, and fire will be burning on them day and night. And there will be these signs in those times. The sun will be blotted out like sackcloth, and the moon clothed as with blood. The earth will quiver, and the sea, and many people will fall. In those times there will also be fallacy on earth. A son will renounce his father, a brother his brother, and even a friend will deceive his friend. God will reject the earth. In those days there will be a great famine and pestilence. Much rebellion and heat and blight, the sword and locust and crawling locust, which will devour the grass of the land. 
There will be in those days a great darkness covering the earth, a gloom for generations. The earth will conceive deceit and will travail and bear iniquity. Dew will be withheld from heaven, rain from the clouds, and fire from the sun will devour the stones of the earth and inflame in the northern regions. It will be burning day and night while devouring dust and roots and stones and trees. In those days the earth will be in uproar and the sea. People will rise against people, kingdom against kingdom, and cities against cities. Um, let's see here. The strongholds of the earth, one against the other, will rebel. In those days angels will go out to the four winds of heaven to make the requital of anger from the midst of the earth. They will begin to strike and to destroy with the sword and with pestilence, also with all kinds of trials. After this there will be silence on earth, and peace will abound. Those who dwell in the world will be healed. The earth will be constrained by its inhabitants, and the seas and islands will be filled with settlements. Settlements and habitations will become towns, and villages will grow. Earth and sea will be adorned with towns and villages, as well as with palaces and buildings. Towns will be erected on the mountains and walls and towers in the plains. Then underneath the silence the winds of heaven will be stirred. Heavenly angels will walk on, the, on earth. The earth will be constrained by its inhabitants, and the sea and the islands by their settlers. They will be given a treacherous sign and a deceiving spirit. And in every place in city, palaces and buildings of corruption will abound. At that time, the winds of the sea will turn around, and dust will fall from heaven unto the earth. Mountains will be raining down ash for many days. The days of the months will be short. The days of the year will quickly go by. The courses of the sun and the moon will be changed, and those times will be filled with deception. The winds of heaven will be bound and will not blow. These clouds of the firmament will be held back and will not traverse. The rain will not descend from heaven and the sun's light will fade, and its light will be like that of the moon. The light of the moon will not be seen, and the stars will not shine, and darkness and gloom will reign on the face of the earth. Evil will abound on earth among the inhabitants of the world. The earth will withhold its fruit, the mountains, their vegetation. A noise will be heard from heaven. There will be horrors and chasms on the mountains, and there will be fear and trembling in various places, with the light of lightnings and in the sound of thunders. The clouds of heaven will move to and, thro to and fro. Heavenly angels will appear on earth like human beings. At that time, a pillar of fire will appear from heaven and will reach to the ground. Darkness will be on earth for many days. The sun will not rise, neither the moon traverse, and the stars will not be seen. During these times, the cities of the sea will be covered. Also, cities will be overflown by the oceans. Many places will be struck by snakes, also many people will go to destruction, and many cities will be subdu subdued into paying tribute. Villages and hamlets will burn with fire. During these times there will be much rage on earth, and fallacy in the world will be increased. Sin will, will abound on earth, and evil which will stretch forth its head. Only a few will be left in the middle of the earth. Spirits and afflictions will increase and will come forth to cause trouble on the earth and to cause corruption on it. During those times, wisdom will abound on earth. False prophets and treacherous teachers will teach all kinds of things. Who will be there in those days of the aforementioned wise men and scribes who will resemble the kingdom of heaven? This kingdom will be invisible to them. Rather, it will be withheld from them. The truth will be revealed to those who seek it. Uh, I'm reading from David, I'm reading from uh, the the Apocalypse of Daniel, Revelation of Daniel. It was found in only one copy in the Syriac. Uh, it's only one copy that was preserved. And this is prophesying of the last days. Um, I don't know how much you heard, but so that's what I'm reading through right now. If you have questions of what I'm reading, please ask those questions. Um, so, in those days there will be tumult day and night, lofty palaces will fall, and many people will perish. 
and high buildings will be cast down and will become tombs for their inhabitants. Many villages will be tossed into the sea and their, habit their, their inhabitants gone in the rushing flood. During those times there will be scarcity on earth and much oppression. The people will be robbing and pl plundering what does not belong to them. There will be much fallacy on earth. True things will be deemed false and what is false will be believed. Truth will pass away from the earth. The kings of the earth will lie and its judges will be perverted in order to reconcile a righteous judgment with dishonest riches or richness. The world will be hard pressed by its sins. All of its inhabitants and cities will be in uproar and villainy will appear on the walls of their towers and they will be filled with deceit and prepared to pronounce fornication and injustice and in laziness will they hasten to recompense iniquity for righteousness and wickedness for goodness. Also their kings will become arrogant and their truth will be deemed a lie and their wealth rejected also their loftiness diminished. In those days the springs of on earth will be wanting, the founts of the earth shall fail, and deep rivers will dry up. Summer days will be in winter, winter days in summer, and the days of the year will be mixed up. Division will fall on the earth, zeal and rebellions among the inhabitants of the world. A son will silence his father in court, and a daughter-in-law will strive with her mother-in-law and will drive her out. In those days the land will be measured in a span, and a cubit will be bought for a mina. Vengeance of anger will visit the earth. The area requiring one core will yield one say, and one thousand vines of the vineyard will yield one measure of wine. Many will sow but not reap, beget but not rear. A man will do business day and night, yet he won't have enough bread. Fathers will bury sons, and also sons' fathers, as it was during the, the years of previous generations. In those days the islands will be dashed into the sea, and those who travel the sea will be cut off together with the islanders. Uh, then the times will be fulfilled, and the last days will draw near, and there will be these signs. The sun's light will fade. The moon will be kept back from its course, also the firmament will conceal its countenance. When the last days are about to draw near, great signs will begin to appear beneath the silence. A great earthquake will be on earth, a prevailing and strong clamor in the firmament of heaven, and a great uproar on earth, and it will be heard from sea to sea, and from the ends of the heaven to the ends of the earth. The clouds of the firmament will be emptied, and between them an immense fire will settle in the four winds of heaven, which will burn the mountaintops four times on a single day. Angels will appear in Zion, holy ones in Jerusalem. Also angelic hosts will appear on the waves of the sea. Then a great fear will reside over the sea, trembling will fall on the islands, and a great earthquake in all inhabitations of the world. And then heavenly angels will appear like fire and will consume many people who are on their way. Then the earth and the sea will be in uproar, and strong and mighty winds will be blowing. In those days the sun will be blotted out like sackcloth, the moon clothed as with blood, and the stars will wither like leaves from the trees, like guardians of fire, arrows, and spears will be hurled over the earth. And then all people and all tongues will be terrified and shaken. Suddenly great horrors and fears will be on earth. The earth will be torn into pieces like a coat until the great abyss. Many people, while still alive, will be swallowed in the midst of the earth. And then mountains will be moved from their places, also hills will move from their sites. And then pillars of fire will appear from heaven, and a fiery furnace from the midst of the clouds. And they will appear on the firmament of heaven like horses of fire and like chariots of war, holding an iron sword and a spear of war. Uh, so all of this that I just read is the prophecies that come before the end. And now, here's where it starts going into the time of the Antichrist. Immediately following it says, It will be in those days, a woman will bear a son from the tribe of Levi, and there will appear on him these signs. Something will be represented on his skin like weapons of war, the details of a breastplate, a bow and a sword, a spear, an iron dagger, and chariots of war. His countenance will be like the countenance of a burning furnace, and his eyes like burning coals. Between his eyes he has a tip 
excuse me, he has a horn whose tip is broken off, and something which has the appearance of a serpent is coming out of it. When these signs are about to occur, then the advent of the senseless, the crooked serpent, Antichrist, or you know, however the original word was, will be about to appear. He will come from the ends of the land of the east to seduce the inhabitants of the world. He will say about himself, I am Christ. He will come out of a serpent's belly from the intestines of an adder. With him will come many guards and mighty angels, or messengers, perhaps. And these are his signs and the awe-inspiring vision of his stature. His head is huge, his, head, his hair red, his eyes blue, and his neck strong. His sides are high, his chest broad, his arms long, and his fingers short. He has two horns next to his ears, and he has strong flesh in his ear as well as lean flesh. His figure is wrathful, stupendous, and furious. The figure of his stature is likewise stupendous. He will appear like lightning in the sky and like a lamp in the camp. With him fiery chariots and war camps, faster than a leopard are his horses, and bolder than the evening wolves his couriers. His stature is great and high and floats over the mountains equal to the clouds in the sky. With him a host of serpents and camps of Indians. Then the gates of the north will be opened before him, and the army of Mebag uh, Mebagbel will come out, in the multitude of the Agagites and Magagites, enormous in their stature, and mighty in their strength, and numerous in their hosts. They will take control of the world, the expanse of the earth, to march from sea to sea, and from one end of the sky to the other. Um, these deeds and signs will he perform. He will be running in front of his troops in his camp, and mountains and hills will be running in the run. He will go out with the sun at sunrise and precede it on its settings and hold it back so it cannot traverse. He will say to the moon to stand still and it will stand still and not move along. He will stretch out his hands toward the firmament of clouds and hold back the rain and the dew. And he will make the clouds of the firmament stand still so that they will not move along. And he will command the winds and they will not blow, and the deep rivers he will make flow backwards. And he will stand in the ocean up to his knees, and his animals will live in fear, and the dragons which live in it will be greatly terrified. Three times on a single day he will run from sea to sea, and from one end of the heavens to the other, and he will stretch out his long arms and gather the birds of heaven, the savage beasts, and birds of prey, yet even his hosts and camps will not be filled. He will pitch his tent opposite Zion, and his tent will settle opposite Jerusalem. The peoples will see him and be afraid, and tribes will be agitated with fear. The islands of the sea will live in fear, thinking that he is Christ. Many will go astray after him, for many signs and wonders he will perform. However, he is unable to raise the dead. His kingdom will last for a time, times, and half a time, that is, three years and six months. He will begin to stir up those who live in Zion, as well as the cult of those foreigners in Jerusalem. He will be cursed from heaven, and he will act deceitfully against those who are close to him. Then the reconciling angel will come forth from before the presence of the mighty Lord with great power and heroic strength. With him angels, men of war, will, who will capture him in the land of the south, in the pathways of the great ocean. They will strike him with an unquenchable fiery sword from head to his knees and split him into two parts and they will toss him to the side of the sea like a giant mountain which has fallen and like a rock which is collapsing. And his end and destruction will occur in the sea. All of his armies and servants will be swallowed up in the sea and will perish. So I'll stop there for now. Um, so... That is the prophecy so far of what's going to happen in the future. And uh, there are some things in there which might be hard for some people to believe is going to happen, but some things in there really sound like similar stuff that's already happened. Uh, you know, it's like uh, it talked about how the Antichrist is going to be able to go from one end of the sea to the other three times in a single day. 
we almost we pretty much have the ability to do that right now almost with uh, the planes going back and forth um, and so many things like that where it's, it talks about it talked about his horses and how he would ride in like a serpent it seems to me that he's trying to describe language of ships like planes or something but he can't he doesn't know how to describe it so he's talking about serpents uh, something like that using the language of his time uh, so there's some really amazing prophecy there it keeps going Daniel keeps going and talks about uh, the after the Antichrist dies there's like chaos and people are waiting to see what happens next and finally the Messiah comes and then there's gonna be the judgment the kingdom will be set up will be the resurrection you know it talks about all that stuff it's some really good stuff near the end of the book it says um, let me see here it says there's something about Passover. It says, um, let's see, after New Jerusalem is built, it says, um, where is it? Um, Hmm, where I'm trying to find it. Okay, so then it says near the end, it says uh, near the end of the book, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff, but so it says, and all the just and righteous will enter, and all who fear the name of the mighty Lord and do his will, and everyone among them will enter into the gate of his father's house and will go to the allotted portion of his tribe. But everybody who cannot enter into the fiery gate will gnash his teeth outside. Jerusalem will be glorious and excellent and set free. A boat of peace and town of peace she will be called. Yet the un the uncircumcised and unclean will not enter into her. Her citizens her citizens will live in her in joy. They will be confident and inher inherit her land as an eternal covenant. Night will no more fall on her, nor will the sun and moon set over her, nor will she need the light of the sun, nor not even that of the moon, for the light of the mighty Lord and the splendor of Christ will be shining over her forever and ever. Then the mighty Lord will gather all the elect of Israel, all the scattered of Judah, and the entire offspring of Abraham, and will celebrate a banquet for Zion and a feast for Jerusalem, also the Paschal feast and joy and glory, a banquet of peace in the days of Christ, at the salvation of Zion, also at the assembling of the exiles of Israel, and all of the just and righteous. Um, so that is, you know, that is, it's an amazing book, I think, and that that gives my view of of what's going to happen. And there's so much stuff that it hasn't happened yet, from what I read. So I think we're going to be in a long haul. There's going to be a lot of stuff's going to happen, and it's going to my view 160 years from now. Think about it. If he comes back 160 years from now, what I just read, all that. That could happen in 160 years' time. There's a lot of time for that to happen. I find it very hard to believe that all that stuff can happen, uh, like in the next 20 years or something. You know how people are trying to say he's going to come back very, very soon. So much of that book hasn't happened yet that it would have to be false prophecy if he's going to come back really soon. So if that book is true prophecy, we still got some time because all this stuff still has to happen. And there's other books of prophecy too, which give some information as well. And they corroborate a lot of the stuff that, that Daniel was telling us in this book of prophecy. So hopefully that answers that question about that. Um, so do you, what, what do you guys think of what I read? Or do you guys have other questions? Do you have other questions that it doesn't have to be related to what I read, but it can be other on other topics? Do you have any questions? And we are about one hour into this. I'll be going for at least, I'm hoping to do it for at least 30 more minutes. I might not do the full two hours this time, depending, but unless you guys ask some really interesting questions or if we get into a good topic, then I might go a little bit closer to two hours. But so, yeah, so here's a good question. Uh, do we know for sure that Jesus 
was in his team, or you know Yeshua, or however you pronounce his name. Do we know that the Messiah was in his team? Here's my take on it. The, from from all the my, my studies on this, we take what did the Pharisees teach? What did the Pharisees believe? What did the Sadducees teach? What did the Sadducees believe? And the same thing with the Essenes. What did they teach? What did they believe? We try to look at the sources, see what the sources say about this. Same thing with the Apostles. What did the Apostles teach? What did they believe? Same thing with the Messiah. And what can we conclude from doing that? Well, I believe my position is almost, it, it, my position is 100% proven if the books I accept are scripture. If the books I don't accept are scripture, then uh, it's it might not be what I say is true. but So let me give an example. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes teach, for a convert to, to the true religion, it takes three years to become a full Essene. Three-year conversion process. And you have to become baptized. Three-year conversion and a baptism. The same thing is in the what the apostles say in extra books. In the Ethiopian Bible, in their New Testament, they say three-year conversion process. That can't be coincidence. I don't think that's a coincidence. So right there, and they have to get baptized. So there's one connection. Then we've got uh, the the Essenes, Dead Sea Scrolls, teach communism, mandatory communism, where everyone, all believers, share everything together. What do we find? We find in the book of Acts, communism. Everybody's sharing everything. In the first couple chapters, we find in uh, in the Ethiopian Bible in their New Testament, the apostles explicitly say you must share everything with each other, the believers. So the apostles are teaching communism exactly the same way that the Essenes were teaching. Uh, if these books are scripture, if if the New Testament books of the Ethiopian Bible are valid, it's teaching uh, communism. Same thing with the Epistle of Barnabas, and there's many other up. Uh, Apostle books that are teaching the uh, a communism view that the Essenes taught. There's also the view of anti-rich. In the Gospels, the Messiah is so anti-rich it's not even funny. He says so many hateful things about rich people, and basically, you know, it's harder for someone who's rich. It's harder for them to be saved than for a camel to do basically the impossible. Some people translate it differently, but you know, it's like. Uh, well, hold on. Let me ask this. Uh, answer the one question. There was a question asking about uh, David was asking, "What was I reading from?" It's from the Revelation of Daniel, the Apocalypse of Daniel. It's an extra book. I believe it was written by Daniel. There's only one copy of it found. The Syriac. It was in a Syriac uh, copy. So that's what I was reading earlier. But so, so I showed right there. Uh, I mean, I explained right there the. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls hate the rich. They're very strongly opposed to the rich. You've got the same thing in the Messiah's words. He's very harsh on the rich and says, you basically got to, what must I do to be saved? That was the question asked. The guy asked him, what must I do to be saved? I've, I've obeyed the commandments. What else do I lack? And he says, go sell everything you have and then you'll be perfect. Go sell everything you have, be, follow me and then you'll be perfect. And that's exactly what the Essenes taught. They had to sell everything they had, give give their money to the uh, community, and then they will be perfect. They will be the true Essenes. That that's their that was their perspective. So that's exactly what the Messiah is saying. That's exactly what the New Testament apocrypha books in the Ethiopian Bible are saying. Is that coincidence? I don't personally. I don't think it is. Uh, let me think of some other examples of interesting things. Um, we see here. Um, they both have similar books they consider scripture. You know, uh, the Pharisees did not accept the extra books. Yet you see all throughout the New Testament, extra books quoting left and right, which we don't have anymore. And the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls, had extra books we don't have anymore. Is that a coincidence? When we see Jude quoting the Book of Enoch as scripture, and there's a Book of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see uh, Jude and the New Testament apocryphal books of the Ethiopian Bible, there and other many other Ethiopian, uh, excuse me, many other apocryphal books uh, of the New Testament era are quoting extra books. 
as inspired scripture. And some of these books are in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jubilees, uh, extra Moses books, extra Jeremiah books, extra Ezekiel books. It's amazing stuff we're seeing. So why is it that the Pharisees, the rabbis, don't quote any of these books at all? And then the Essenes are so like focused on it, and the apostles are too. The apostles like accept them with full authority. That's an amazing connection right there. You've got the apostle, uh, the Essenes teach polygamy is a sin and against the law. The Pharisees teach no, it's not. The the Messiah in the New Testament clearly says uh, having more than one wife is adultery. He says if you divorce a woman and marry another, you commit adultery. And a, and the man who marries the woman also commits adultery. That's what it says. So if it, if polygamy, if having more than one wife was not a sin, then it would not have been adultery to divorce and then marry. Uh, um, and so you've got the the Messiah clearly opposing polygamy, more than one wife, the, the Essenes opposing it, and the extra books of the New Testament uh, of the Ethiopian Bible. They condemn having more than one wife explicitly. The Pharisees approve of it. There's another connection. Another one is the Dead Sea Scrolls say uh, the Essenes taught that you are not allowed to marry your niece. The law, as the Pharisees preserve for us, says uh, in, in most people's Bibles, the law does not say you can't marry a niece. It only says you can't marry an aunt. So the Pharisees said, oh, well, it says you can't marry an aunt, but you can marry a niece. That's okay. And the Pharisees teach that to this day. They still teach that, the rabbis. The Dead Sea Scrolls actually have the version of the law, the Temple Scroll, which explicitly says, no, that's a sin. Their documents, Damascus document, says, no, that's a sin. That's, all, that's unlawful. And what do we see? We see in the Ethiopian extra books of the New Testament the same thing. It's condemning having uh, marrying your niece. When you start looking like that and the coincidences pile up, it no longer becomes how do we know they're in a scene. It becomes this has to be the case because if these books are valid, it's clear that they have to be a scene. Uh, so it, it just keeps piling up. There's um, the their, the Eucharist that the, the New Testament was doing, so similar to what they were doing in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a special bread feast that they were doing. Um, and so, you know, it's really amazing similarities. I, I find what they all line up so that it's, to me, it's I, it has to be the case that they were scenes. Now, it's possible that the Messiah slightly disagreed with a couple of scene ideas, like perhaps, I personally don't think this is the case, but perhaps the Messiah was not as strict as the Essenes for the Sabbath. The Sabbath, uh, the, the Essenes were very strict for the Sabbath. And we know the Messiah's teaching in the Gospel seems to be much laxer. Uh, but in my, I interpret the Messiah's words differently than a lot of people do. Uh, I don't think he was saying certain things of the Sabbath that most people think. Uh, I think people are misinterpreting his words. So, uh, But that could be one issue, even though I don't think it is. But that could be an issue that the Essenes were a little bit more stricter on the Sabbath. But otherwise, it's the same thing. Uh, here's another example of similarity. The Dead Sea Scrolls have extra holy days, extra festivals that the Pharisees don't have. Uh... The, the New Testament Apocrypha of the Ethiopian Bible has extra festivals, extra holy days. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls has e a, another priesthood and a, uh, they do their own sacrifices. Same thing with the New Testament Apocrypha. They have their own priests, their own sacrifices, contrary to the priesthood in Jerusalem. Uh, so there's so many similarities. It just, I need, I have to conclude he has to be an Essene. Maybe he reformed the Essene slightly by changing a couple things, but otherwise he's pretty much an Essene. That's what, that's what I've seen from all the evidence. Now, uh, a question was asked about cousins. The law does not actually outlaw marrying your cousins. It's possible that now it is forbidden to do it because the 
the bloodline is too close now, but it never outlawed it. So it never outlawed it. So for so many years, it was never wrong. Uh, cousins, second cousins, third cousins, none of that's outlawed in the scriptures. But it's possible that now, because the genetic code has been so corrupted, maybe now cousins are not okay to marry. And perhaps even second and third cousins, but probably not. So, uh, But cousins, cousins are really close, so that's an issue that might be making the cousins not okay. But nowhere does it say it in, lo in the scriptures that cousins cannot uh, marry. Now, my take on Zionism. The question was asked, Zionism, uh, it depends what you call Zionist uh, or Zionism, but personally I, my view is that I believe that Israel is, uh, the, the people who are there are Israel. Uh, they are descended from the bloodline, but they are not righteous. So uh, they are not, you know, they are still going to be held accountable, and we shouldn't uh, just give them, we shouldn't just like uh, ignore what they're saying. Uh, we, we shouldn't just like uh, give them a pass and judge them as righteous just because they're Israelites. I don't think we should do that. But I personally think that the people in Israel are the true people, and then. Here's what we see in the, uh, in the, uh, I believe the scriptures teach that Israel is supposed to have authority over the whole world. Uh, the war scroll, we talked about that, um, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the war scroll, that's going to be happening, a war is going to happen, Israel is going to fight that war. And it says in, in the war scroll who is they're going to fight. Israel is going to fight for the first 10 years, um, I forget. I think it fights everyone at first, and then it fights for 10 years. Uh, Shem's, the, the countries of Shem, so you know, the Muslim nations, uh, Asian nations, um, kind of fight to war with them. Then the following 10 years, I think it's going to be Japheth, so it's going to be fighting with European nations in the various years. And then uh, the final 10 years, I think it said it was going to be Ham. So the African nations. Uh, so we see here that you know uh, there's going to be some major, major uh, fighting that's going to be happening, and Israel is going to be hated a lot, uh, and people are going to think Israel is evil, satanic for for starting the war. They're probably going to start the war. How they're probably going to start it? I bet this is how the war is going to start. The, where the dome is. I bet they're going to tear down the dome, the dome and try to build uh, the temple there. And that's going to cause an outcry and it's going to cause a world war. And everyone's going to fight. That's, I believe, how it's going to go down. That war is going to be 40 years long, according to the war scroll. So, Israel is going to be hated for that, you know. But I think Zionism, uh, in from how I understand what the truth of the scriptures teaches, Israel is the chief. Uh, Israel is... Uh, superior to the other nations and we are to respect Israel uh, so I don't personally subscribe to the view that you know Zionism is evil or that there are Jews trying to who are being evil trying to manipulate things into a one world order personally I don't think that's the case I think uh, I think that is a way of people trying to I think that's Satan's way of trying to attack his attack the, the holy people um, but I try to be open to evidence too because I know a lot of people who are listening to this who will be listening to this might strongly disagree with what I'm saying uh, but I'm open I'm always open to evidence I've changed a lot of my beliefs over the years uh, so I am open to the idea that uh, Israel is not the true people but I just seen certain things which make me think they are like the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the exact same year that Israel was restored as a nation, 1948. Is that a coincidence? Maybe. But I think it's something more significant than that. And then the Temple Scroll? The Temple Scroll was recovered in the very same week that they uh, won uh, Jerusalem to Israel. So is that a coincidence? Maybe that's a coincidence too. But I don't know. I think It seems to me that these things are lining up, and there's so many things, like the scriptures prophesy of Israel being restored and Jerusalem being restored in the last days before the Messiah returns, and that is what has happened. 
so I really think that this is the this is prophetic. That this uh, and they're not an evil. This wasn't uh, anti uh, that Israel was put into a nation, but I think he used the Gentiles to bring back his people. But not all his people. It's only starting, and there's going to be a long time before the full return comes. Uh, but I believe Israel is a force for good, but that there is some corruption in Israel too. We can't deny that. There's corruption in every nation, but I believe that they are that it is something good uh, that that Israel is, and that the Jew, I don't think there's a conspiracy of the Jews in my current view. I'm very skeptical of pretty much all conspiracies, unless I see absolute compelling evidence that it has to be the case. If there's any other way to interpret it that's not ridiculous, I'm going to interpret it in a way that's not conspiratorial. Because in my view, conspiracies are a last resort. We, sh we should never say there is a conspiracy unless we know for certain there is. Because if we're wrong, if we're wrong, and it wasn't a conspiracy, then we did some major evil by by saying people are uh, by you know by by saying people are uh, doing something bad when they're not. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the ultra orthodox they have a belief. They believe that the Messiah is supposed to come back and build the temple, and that the Messiah is supposed to come and build the New Jerusalem. And to restore Israel, so their theological belief is the reason why they are anti-Israel, uh, because they don't think that it is their place to bring this about. They think no, the Messiah is going to do that. They got to stop doing that. So I disagree. I think the scriptures are actually teaching that Israel is supposed to be doing this. Uh, I, I see some evidence for that, including in the Book of Enoch. That's one of the biggest evidences. Uh, and about the Masonic lodges. Well, I don't agree with the uh, Masons. Uh, I don't know everything they do there. But secret societies, you know, I'm I'm iffy on secret societies. I don't know what they do. Uh, I don't know if they serve Lucifer or not. I've heard a lot of things about them. Uh, there might be some Jews that are part of the Masonic lodges, but I don't think... I think a lot of people say things about these secret societies which they don't have absolute proof for, and there's a lot of speculation, which is accepted as proof which we should go we got to be careful about um, I would say you know don't trust the Masonic lodges but don't believe anything about them either you you got to be fair in your judgment uh, and they're secret societies for a reason they're hiding what they're doing so if you're hearing people tell you what they're doing you got to ask well how do they know that how do they know what they're doing if it's a secret well, the only way they could know is if they somehow infiltrated, or if they were a Mason. And if they were a Mason, then can you trust them? If they were a Mason and they're telling you information, can you trust them? Or are they trying to stir things up, you know? Who knows, you know? So you got to be careful with all that. Uh, and let me see, uh, there's a statement about the homilies of Clement speaks of fasting before baptism is this an a scene practice um, I don't know if it's an a scene practice in the Dead Sea Scrolls I don't I haven't found that but what I have found is that that practice is also said in the New Testament Apocrypha of the Ethiopian Bible uh, it is requirement um, it's in DDK it's in the DDK uh, so I believe that is a valid requirement that you're supposed to fast before baptism uh, and I believe that's the apostolic practice. It is the it's what the Messiah taught us to do, I believe. Um, and Valerie was asking earlier about... Uh, I made a statement saying that the apostles accepted the extra books with full authority. And she said, did I hear that right? And wow, you know, basically, I believe that. D d it, it, is my belief true? Did the apostles accept these extra books as with full authority? Well, let's, uh, you know, if you look at how the apostles quote these extra books, they're quoting them on the same level that they quote the, the regular books of the Bible. Like in Jude, Jude 14 to 15. Jude is, listen, Jude is writing one small letter, and he starts out saying, 
I wanted to write to you about something else, the common salvation which we have, but I thought it necessary to write to you concerning more pressing, urgent matters, because there are people coming to the faith and threatening to, to, uh, to harm, you know, that there are people coming in, in, infiltrating the faith, and they are you know, making these people's faith in jeopardy. Because of this happening, I can't write about what I wanted to write, but I got to write about this urgent issue. So Jude writes a, one letter, one chapter long, it's really small, small chapter. You could think, okay, if I had only one letter to write to for my defense of the one true faith, I got to defend the one true faith. I, got, I can only write one chapter, it's going to be small. What do I say? What, should, what book should I quote from? How should I try to defend the one true faith? He quotes from two extra books only as his defense of the one true faith. Why isn't he quoting from the Law of Moses? Why didn't he quote from the Gospels? Why didn't he say, hear the law? You know, he's not doing that. What's he quoting from? The Apocrypha of Moses and the Apocrypha of Enoch. And he's appealing to those as as his argument against these heretics trying to destroy the one true faith. So it seems clear to me that Jude considered those books foundational to his faith, because otherwise he wouldn't, if you were writing a letter, you wouldn't pick books you didn't consider that important. Like, if I was writing you one small letter about trying to convince you to, to stop doing something evil, would I quote to you from the Quran? Would I quote to you from uh, pagan philosophers? Or what I quote to you from the scriptures, so because you guys accept the scriptures, so what I qu quote to you the, the scriptures, which you guys know and believe, and will you know you know what he's saying is true. The scriptures we gotta we gotta repent and we gotta follow what the scriptures are saying. He's right, but if I quote to you the Quran or something you don't accept as important, or and that I don't accept as important, I'm quoting to you a false book that's that I even say is heretical. Why are you going to listen to what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. So Jude wrote a letter specifically quoting Enoch as scripture. He said, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. So that means it was the man Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, and then he quotes from the book of Enoch. So he's saying that that quote from the book of Enoch is what Enoch himself prophesied. And 2 Peter says, what prophets speak is not of themselves, but it comes from the divine inspiration. So with that together, Jude and 2 Peter is telling us Enoch divi uh, was divinely inspired because he prophesied. And the book of Enoch is written by Enoch because they're Jude is quoting the book of Enoch as Enoch's own prophecy. So we see that the, the apostles clearly accepted these extra books as scripture. A full authority and we're finding that in the other books too and so many extra books at the New Testament Apocrypha they're quoting these extra writings as the same level of authority as the regular Bible so that's why I say I believe the Apostles accepted the extra books because that's what the evidence is telling me from the New Testament and from these other New Testament Apocrypha books as well um, so hopefully you found that interesting. Um, let's see here. Okay, we are at about at the one hour and 30 minutes mark. Do you guys have more questions for me uh, here? Or how are you guys doing? Uh, do you want to hear a little bit more of the teaching? Or I could talk about anything, whatever you guys are interested in hearing. This is the question and answering you can ask anything whatever interests you I'll wait for a minute to see yeah you're welcome Valeria it's really good to, to share these teachings with you guys you know there's so much amazing stuff that people haven't known uh which they haven't they haven't heard from there's so many amazing truths that are withheld from the people um so 
if there's anything on your guys mind please ask and if, if not I will try to share a little um, okay all right so I'm gonna say some final thoughts because I want to go slightly a little bit longer uh, okay here's a good question um, it's something I mentioned earlier I was reading a prophecy from Daniel and it mentioned horns for the Antichrist so the question is are horns in the scriptures evil or good basically horns um, seems to symbolize power um, but if it's talking about literal horns in the prophecy if there's a literal horn that's going to be on the Antichrist it's going to be a flaw of his body uh, and there's actually there are people who have like physical defects where they like, have horns or things like that so uh, but that's that's a flaw that's a bodily flaw but when the scriptures speak of horns normally for the righteous it's like a power uh, it's the same thing for the wicked they can have power too um, basically I, I let me let me share some things with you guys just as a final some final thoughts uh, Um, could you clarify your question? You're saying uh, Genesis six four. I believe uh, I believe that account is referring to the angels. Uh, now, what is the question about? Oh, uh, to Antichrist. You're saying uh, was could he be a Nephilim hybrid? Uh, yeah, that could be. Uh, yeah, that very well could be. Uh, not certain though. Um, it says it's going to be born from a, a woman from the tribe of Levi so that, that was from the passage we read uh, so it could be a repeat it could be a repeat for the Antichrist that he is from angelic origin just like in Genesis 6 but I'm not quite sure it doesn't say it specifically in, in the passage I was reading so I don't want to assume that's going to happen but we have to consider that is a possibility uh, that, that it might be that way. Um, now, I, I here's what I want to tell you guys. Um, I have resources. I've been doing uh, resources where I've been having a library. I have so many resources, PDF files, and there's also there's there's files for for secular writing, which is not scripture, which is not biblical. Then there's files for the Bible, and uh, there's so much great stuff there, especially the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I really recommend you guys to study the Genesis Apocryphon. That's one of the foundational documents that's a, of our faith, I believe. The Genesis Apocryphon consists of the Book of Lamech, written by the father of Noah. Then there's the Book of Noah, written by Noah himself. The Book of Abraham, written by Abraham himself. That's what you want to read. Genesis Apocryphon. It's fragmentary, but you'll get a lot of wisdom and blessing out of that book, I believe. And the Enochian writings and the patriarch writings are so important. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, that's a key document. I believe you've got to read it. Uh, the Adam and Eve, that's, a, that's an okay one. That, that, I, I accept that, but it's, I find it not as foundational as these other writings. Um, and I really think, I urge you guys to look into the Ethiopian Bible. Because I, th I believe... The Ethiopian Church is the closest group currently that has a lot of members. The closest group to the One True Faith. I think the Ethiopians got a lot right. They didn't get everything right. But I really advise you guys to check them out. Look into them. Do research. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a list of all the books I consider scripture on my, um, on my site. So I can send you guys on Facebook that, that list. Um, so there are so many amazing writings so many secrets and things that people don't realize so many things about the prophecies of end times just so much life and depth in these writings which very few are having um so i guess uh well, let me say are there any other questions and if they're not then i'll probably end it but if there are questions then i'll keep going because I usually do it between one hour and a half and two hours. So if there's some more interesting questions, please share.
Uh, but if there's not, then I'll I'll put it for a close. And just so you know, the book that I was reading from, The Apocalypse of Daniel, I have that on my on my website. You can read that whole book. Uh, you can read that book yourself uh, on my on my website. And there are certain books in the Ethiopian Bible which have not been translated yet. I'm in the process of translating them um, so that we can study them together. And there's some amazing things in these extra books. It's just I know I'm a little bit repeating myself, but it's just I'm convinced the Essenes are the true faith because of what I've seen in these documents. There's just so much evidence from what I've been seeing. There's no way I I see there's no way it could be made up or it could just be a hoax. There's just too much. It'd have to be the ultimate conspiracy. It just doesn't make sense to for it to be an ultimate conspiracy like that. Because so few accept these writings, who are they trying to do a conspiracy against when no one even cares about these writings. So I'm strongly convinced, you know, these writings are describing our time so accurately, and they wrote thousands of years ago. How do they know this? Uh, so uh, I'm going to do this again next Sunday. I'm going to do my study next Sunday. I hope you guys attend. I thank you all for coming. Um, and if you have any questions, on, uh, please ask me on Facebook. You can ask me any time of the week. I, I am free all the time to talk. And there's just I'd, – I'd really like to start studying with people on a more regular basis. I mentioned in the previous, uh, the previous session that we can actually start doing a Bible study where what we're doing right now, that's a Bible study, but it's like a question and answer thing. We could actually start reading through a Bible, like a book of the Bible or Scripture, as a group. And studying it like a Torah portion that type of thing you know we could do a Bible portion of a book if you really need to start doing that with some of you guys if you're interested so we might start doing that but who knows we'll see but uh, next week I'll continue with this series it'll be the same thing question and answers and I'm glad you were able to come today uh, Shalom thank you all for your questions it was very interesting uh, this is being recorded so you can listen to the full thing if you missed out on parts of it. Alright, shalom you all.